Welcome to The Lifestyle Chase, Season 2. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. I'm your host, Chris Little. Let's get started. The Lifestyle Chase is brought to you by Yeg Fitness. Yeg Fitness is Edmonton, Alberta, Canada's healthy lifestyle community, creating and supporting active living for all. Check them out online at yegfitness.ca and on social media at yegfitness. Today's podcast interview is with Kay Liebeck. She has been a teacher, she's a mother, she's an athlete, she's an author. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Be sure to uh, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and thank you for listening. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase, episode 121. I am joined by Kay Liebeck. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? Not too shabby. Um, tell me something cool that's happened in the last week, if you can think of something. Um, something cool in the last week would probably just be that I have two teenagers who are home due to current circumstances. And so we have been in the backyard trying to come up with interesting fun things to do within our small, we have a small backyard. So we have a couple of yoga balls, we have a pull up bar. So we've been doing yoga ball tricks and just trying to break up the days with something a little more fun. So what was your first thoughts when everything changed with, with the pandemic and having to shift life around and having to come up with fun things to do? Like, with limited resources, because I know a lot of people will be able to relate to that scenario. Um, yes, a teenage, my teenagers can spend a lot of time in their bedrooms. <laughs> so, and especially now that their school is online. So it's a tricky to figure out if they're online for school or if they're online for fun and video games and such. So, um, I think my worry is always that they're breaking their day up into parts and that we see each other and that they're not spending too much time. They're doing time management. So I think as a parent, I want to help them develop that skill on their own so that when they leave the house in a few years, they'll have that time management and be able to think of different things to do even when they're just at home to break up the day. I like that. If you were to describe yourself to my audience as like describing yourself in the ways that uh, you are most proud of yourself, the things that you take the most pride in, like who, who are you? Like, what do you do? What, what is your purpose and such? Um, that's a tough one. I'd say, you know, as a family member, I'm a mom, I'm a caregiver. Um, helping them develop into the best that they can become while they're here with me is probably my number one um, at the moment. Uh, I think overall, I probably am a caregiver since I became a teacher. And um, I just want to help people become the best that they can to believe in themselves. Um, So I think that's my number one role. Yeah, I like that. When it comes to being a teacher, what was, what was the thing that introduced you to being a teacher? It would be my mom. She was a teacher. And so I'd hear a lot of her stories about teaching and she'd mostly share the fun ones. And so it just seemed like, you know, man, what a great job. I'm not at a desk. I'm with children. I get to have fun. Um, and children are filled with wonder and excitement and there's so much joy there that it just seemed like a great place to go and be and i loved school growing up so it was a place for me that i loved to learn and i loved to be in the classroom so what was your favorite subject as as a student i would say probably writing although i really didn't enjoy the assignments but maybe i liked the process 
Yeah. Well, I mean, what is it about the process that makes it uh, so special for you? I think when you do a written piece, there's the revision of it and, you know, that same process of going over and over it. So by the time that you hand it in or turn it in, you have it feels like it's more like a part of you, like there's some piece of you in there that you're getting to share that if you hadn't written it out and revised it and went over it, that that piece wouldn't be there. So I think it was a sharing even though I don't think I saw it that way then, I think it was a, wow, I'm turning something in that is a little bit of me. Yeah, well, I mean, like, I've seen how it's sort of transformed because, like, you've created at least one book so far. Like, I, I've seen the book that you've shared on your, your Instagram, and I like how you describe it as being something that can be relatable, something that can help kids and stuff like that what what inspired you to create that in the first place what was the the moment in which you're like okay I'm gonna make this book this is what I'm gonna do <laughs> that was kind of a long uh, surprising journey I never had a book in my mind at all but I uh, like you said I I feel the power of stories and the power of sharing a story and uh, I had come up with this story with this dog character based off of my real life. And, uh, and I was telling the story in a class that I was giving. And then I made it into a like little puppet show with paper figures. And then, and the story seemed to resonate. The children seemed to connect to it. And so I thought, well, I want to try and reach as many children as I can. So that's when I actually wrote it down and then slowly it just turned into, well, maybe it could be a book. Why could it not be a book? And and then so self-published it and went from there. So yeah, right before the pandemic, I was just getting into the classroom for uh, author visits. So it had been 15 years since I'd been in the classroom because I'd been at home with my own children. So that was really exciting and the chance to share the book with them and yeah it was going in a good direction so yeah well <laughs> I mean fun. life is kind of crazy in the way that we think that we're going in a good direction and it stops but truly we never stop yeah. going in a good direction it just looks different so what yeah have you learned in this period of uh, self-reflection? Like, I know a lot of people have found out a lot of things about themselves with their lifestyle changing and everything changing. What what have been your major takeaways in the last couple months? I think a major one is I keep coming back to circles. I, I see things in a lot of shapes and colors and, and, um, like you said, you know, it felt like everything was kind of going in the right direction before the pandemic. And then I had a period there where I was like, you know, lost direction. Like, now what am I going to do? And then after a few weeks, you know, one of my difficulties originally was getting into the schools, getting back in. And now the children are out of the schools. So oddly, I was like, Wow, you know, they're, <laughs> now I'm back to where they're at home and maybe I can reach them in a different way that I was trying to reach them originally, but I couldn't. So shifting to, okay, maybe I need to do something online. But I think the biggest takeaway was these circles. A reason that I think I like teaching is how it expands each year they add on. So in kindergarten, you start at the center and they're learning to communicate and cooperate and share. And it's all these basic, seemingly simple, but strong character development. And then you, you slowly expand that first grade, they expand to their community in the school, then they expand to the neighborhood and then they expand to the city, nation, world. And I felt like I sucked back into that center and was reminded that that right there, that center, that character development, that cooperation, that's the lesson. You just have to expand it to a larger group. So now we're looking at the greater good, 
but we're doing it from our center of ourselves. I like that analogy. Um, something that I experience sometimes is like, I'll kind of see things in such a way as that, just the, the greater good and like seeing like a process, trusting the process, but then it just doesn't seem like the world is going my way. Have you ever found yourself in a scenario like that? Yes. Yes. That was a huge struggle when I first started. So I was, a, I've been at home with my children and I want to go back to some sort of work because they're teenagers, but I wasn't sure I wanted to go back into the regular classroom setting. So my favorite part of being a teacher was the building a community, like, like the excitement of us being in that classroom, growing and learning together and knowing each other and appreciating all our differences and all that. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I can develop something where I'm just focusing on my favorite part of teaching and I don't have to teach math or, you know, what have you. So, uh, but my struggle was that uh, people weren't seeing, to me, it felt like parents and people weren't seeing the importance of that, of developing that, of directly teaching that, not hoping that the children will pick it up from playing in group sports or pick it up from watching their family members, but directly talking about all those words about growth and resilience and cooperation and connection. So they were too big. They couldn't find, I felt like I couldn't go forward with my class because there wasn't time for that topic because, you know, grades are number one and then being on sports and so that was a huge struggle for me to figure out well how to go around you really got me thinking because i'm on the same page i mean i think there's a lot and i think i've seen a lot of my friends who are parents like see that with their kids and that this is a great opportunity to instill those characteristics like resilience and just these other things that aren't the paper grades and they aren't the things that you can see in a yearbook or see on credentials, but they're like really important to life. Like when, when life knocks okay. you down, how do you get back up? Or when, when you need help, like how do you call upon people? How do you make really genuine high quality connections with people in your life? Um, when right. it comes to connection, how would you define connection in your own words? Oh. I think connection for me today is realizing, knowing that we all share a process of becoming whoever it is we want to become, that we all have struggles. I think, you know, social media a lot of times helps, makes us think everything needs to be perfect and that these wonderful things just happen to people. But if we have this connection to the process and the connection that we all share that process, then there's comfort in that. And that connection helps us continue on our own journey and helps us feel for others as well. I like how you speak about empathy, um, like not directly, but just feeling for others and expressing empathy. And I think that's such an important characteristic for people. Um, when is a time that you can recall, if at all, that uh, in your life, someone has expressed like really memorable empathy towards you? And what was that experience like? Um, I would say I through my weightlifting, CrossFit slash weightlifting journey, was re where I really connected with that, where I really felt like somebody understood what I was going through. And even though, you know, sometimes you think uh, weightlifting or sports seems like a silly place to have empathy because it's just sports. It's not, but that's where I, through that, I learned my strongest lessons, I think, about um, 
feeling and empathy and putting your place in some putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and knowing that even you know the top level athletes share that same journey with you and they can even though we're totally on different um, expertise levels that we still struggle with the same things can you and think, I think of I have, uh, some coaches who helped me to see that can you think of like the first moment when it was just like wow like we are all in kind of the the same world the same position thinking the same way is just in different places in our journey um I don't know if there's one specific moment that comes to mind. Um, I think uh, um, well, I don't know. I would say when I was 12, we were hit by a drunk driver, my whole family, when we were on vacation. And so um, that was traumatic and but I always had uh, wondered about the drunk driver who hit us. And I never knew who he was, but I always realized, I think even at that young age, but more so as I aged, that the choice he made was just a tiny choice that impacted all of us and impacted him and I, always hope that it impacted his life in a positive way and that it didn't make it worse and there is a uh oh, sorry <laughs> probably growing up there's a guilt to feel for somebody who hurt you, but I don't know that I connected with him. So. Yeah, I mean, that's such a powerful way to see things. And I think it, it honestly, people talk about strength and how strength is expressed. Um, I believe strength is expressed in our ability to show emotion um, when we are sad or feeling just emotion of any capacity um to express that quite genuinely is a, a sign of strength and like so for if you saw like a 300 pound power lifter walk into the gym and it looks like he could move a house but he happens to show emotion over his kids or over something he's passionate about it's not necessarily a sign of, of weakness. It's a sign of something being so deeply meaningful to him. Um, and it's it's shows his, his strength, as it were. So I think it's, it's good that you express that because it's like everybody's going to be finding themselves in someone else's shoes. It's not too dissimilar to your... Um, what you've talked about, like even on your Instagram profile with, with writing and, and like we're creating moments for people to relate to. We are finding these connection pieces. Um, mm -hmm. We're enabling other people to be more resilient through the, the stories of, of others. And so for, for someone to be able to, to relate to anybody else's situation, it's, it's not too different than in our current times when we look out and we see like yeah like our lives are a little are a little off but like just imagine being in someone else's shoes i think about how like my my employment dynamics are a little different with gyms closed i i am a trainer that's that's what i do but then it's like yeah but there's other people that have it way worse i think about people with family in the hospital i think about people without a home i think about people who don't have like any means to to get by i mean it, it's crazy and empathy is such a powerful thing so i really liked how you expressed that um getting back on to like i'm curious about your your fitness journey you talked about weightlifting you talked about crossfit um 
what introduced you to that in in the very first place? Uh, I was always in sports growing up, um, tennis and running. So I played tennis in college. And then um, after college, just went into running because you can do that after work and with friends and just ran forever, you know, just road running. And then uh, when I had my children, I pushed them in the double stroller and all that. And I did a run with my husband that's called the Hood to Coast here in Portland, where we, it's a team relay run and you start at the top of Mount Hood and you, as a team, you run to the coast in legs. And uh, I hated it. (laughs) So it was supposed to be this great, good time. And I was like, I, I don't even think I like to run. I was like, why am I running all the time? I don't even think I like to do it. So I left that and I was like, I need I need to find something else, I think, because I don't think I like to do this. And uh, so I Googled or I was Googling things and I found a Groupon to CrossFit. Never heard of it. So showed up, did my on my first day did my first burpee never heard of a burpee and then from there i was just kind of hooked so it was just a total chance thing but i think it introduced back into my life um a place to push myself yeah uh, I, I was willing to push myself physically which eventually turned into pushing myself mentally and so, so- when when you made that uh, revelation that you realized you didn't really like running, um, yeah. have, you, have you ever applied that uh, that soul searching process to other other aspects of life? Like I know a lot of people, they've had so much time to reflect on the things that they do day to day, and they may have like refined their process and eliminated some things that they used to do before the pandemic that they didn't actually like doing. And then when they're spending time by themselves, they stop doing those things and they feel so much better. Have you found anything that you can think of in, in that way? Um, well, I'm a pretty big homebody, so I stayed home quite a bit. Um, but I would say I, I've, it was, I've, it's really reinforced that I just really don't like to cook or make meals. <laughs> As much as, you know, a stay-at-home mom should just be in the kitchen making bread and all these things. And even with the time now that I have to do it, I really, it's not my thing. So, And it's totally <laughs> so, fine. Like, that's the thing. Yeah. Nobody has to fit inside a box. Just because you, just because somebody else does something doesn't mean it defines you and what you do. So... Yeah. I want to know what are the things that you do enjoy doing like aside from aside from fitness aside from writing what are the things that you've discovered about yourself that you do like to do I love to do just little fun things um and as I told my family uh yesterday I like especially when we do them all together <laughs> and just really goofy like uh, the foot I've been doing this footloose, uh, recreating the footloose opening scene with the feet. So uh, my girlfriends were like, "Why are you doing that?" And I was like, "Well, because I don't like the baked bread." I- <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find something to do, and and you know the kids can help me pick out the matching shoes in the house that I need to find, or the clothing. You know, just something. I guess maybe it's making memories, making moments. Um, and I like to, and I do like to draw and do creative things. Uh, here in Portland, we have the uh, Rose Festival every end of May, beginning of June, and it's a huge two week um, festival. We have several parades and uh, carnival and you know all this rose princesses it's huge anyway all these things which can't happen now so they are doing a porch parade so you can sign up and decorate your porch and then they'll put out a map and people can drive by the floats that are on your porch instead of a regular old parade 
So my mom signed us up for that. So for the past four weeks, we've been preparing our porch float. <laughs> so, <laughs> so arts and crafts. I like that innovation. Like, I mean, it's all about uh, outlook. I mean, just because certain things can't happen doesn't mean other things can't happen. I mean, I've seen people organize like uh, recipe meetups on the internet where everybody works on the same recipe and they get on the video call and they all work on it together. And so for a person that like might not like cooking, that might just be fun just to watch everybody else do it. Um, <laughs> And just so many ways of innovating and creating. Uh, I've seen the different like ninja porch drop offs or somebody just anonymously just drops off like a, a bundle of goods on somebody else's front deck or front balcony mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And it's just so cool to see people almost reinvent themselves or reinvent their processes and find new ways yeah. to find the good. As far as yeah. the topic of reinvention goes, um, have you ever found yourself in a position where you're like, okay, I'm just going to start fresh and we are going to do things a little bit new and it's a little bit scary, but we're, we're going to give it a shot. Uh, yes. For myself, it's mainly, um, you asked about connection earlier and what, how I define connection. Uh, that's been a relationship wise connecting with people has always been difficult for me. So uh, in the last two years, I've really been pushing myself to try my best to connect and communicate more. And so changing from not doing the social things to trying the social things and to actually conversing <laughs> more has been huge for me. So that's been something that I've really had to, you know, when you make a change, you really have to focus on it daily or moment by moment. Well, and, I like that you outline that. And I think that a lot of people, a surprising amount of people might find themselves in a place where they could relate to the previous version of you where they, they're they identifying something that they want to change, but it's really tough and they don't know really how to do it. Um, what was your like little step-by-step, -step, small change by small change process like, like if you could outline it? Um, definitely little by little for sure. And that the, uh, the beginning would be the hardest, taking the first action. But I think there's first actions after the first action. Like uh, my first step, I guess, would have been um, I invited a close group of friends over. This was almost two years ago to tell them about what I feel my purpose is with helping children and where I think that stems from. So I just invited them to the backyard and um, talked about that out loud to a small intimate group. And then after that, I then stepped back into like a classroom setting. It was a gym classroom setting and practiced what I had been building or what I had been hoping I had building, been building. And then just going from there, connecting with people online as well. Um, I think Instagram, social media has been beneficial for me because I could connect behind the screen, but I tried to deepen the connection. So it started out as this is a safe place that I can connect because it's a distance but to try and turn that into more has been a big goal so it's been little by little with big steps where i pushed myself along the way and it's ongoing well it's super cool to hear about that gathering that you set up with with close friends and just how you spoke about like kind of putting it out into the world um there's a lot of people 
with big dreams in this world where you put that out there at first and unless you say it out loud, it doesn't really have power. Once you say it out mm-hmm. loud, it, it has some power, but it might just have power to you. So it's probably going to still be a struggle. Um, right. Like for myself, like most, most of what I do is like, he does that for work. Like he watches people work out for work or like he, there's so many different things like people, people can make their income off the internet through social media posts. People can make their income off of YouTube, off of like uh, ad revenue. It's the world is full of uh, like unicorn jobs, like things that you would never think mm-hmm. that you could actually make a go of. And right. in times like now, in times of uncertainty, it's, it's a, a great attitude, attitude to have understanding that like if you believe in yourself enough, you could probably make it happen. Like we think about Amazon and uh, just how successful Amazon was. And there would have been a time when somebody would be like, you bought a toaster off the internet off who? Like, or like, what is this internet you speak of? (laughs) And then, so I think we, we can circle back and then understand like, it doesn't. I think that's like, uh, sorry. Oh, good. Go ahead. I, I think there's this huge power and possibility. So I think of motivation. I mean, what makes it so that somebody can uh, have a dream or say what they want to do that seems far out there and then they make it happen? I think there has to be this like push from purpose and this pull from possibility that helps you to move along. And I think if you can't envision a possibility, like it's out there, um, that's why I'm working so hard for it because I know it could be a possibility, but without the purpose pushing you, driving you from behind, I think you have to have both. You have to have a push and a pull. For sure. I mean, to, to be able to choose to do something because it is deeply meaningful to you and not deeply meaningful to somebody else. Like for, for myself, I choose my career because of how much purpose it gives me to do that career. Not because I right. saw like uh, some fitness person do it and I thought that they must feel good. It's just like, no, it's very deeply meaningful to me. So I totally get that. And then for yourself and like, with everything that you want to be for the youth of the future, like creating grit and resilience through storytelling or through connection or any capacity in which you have the power to do so. Um, I can already tell you, you have a great purpose to do so. And then it's just a matter of like taking the little steps forward. Um, something, and I guess as a backstory for how we essentially got connected was our mutual friend, Carl Powley. So like, yes. I want to know what, what was your intro to, to Carl? Like what, because I, I can sense that there's quite a story to it, or at least a, a really strong connection. And I, I think that's really cool. Mm-hmm. So if you can tell more about that, that would be great. Yeah, I think so. I have been in CrossFit for, I'll just say 10 years. So quite a long time. And I believe I stumbled up upon Carl for um, gymnastics help, uh, handstand push-ups and ring dips and all that. So I think I was watching him online for tutorial stuff along that line. And then, um, and then he kind of disappeared for a while off social media. And then when he picked back up, my, I was still following him. So he, and so I was still there listening uh, and it was a bit of a different, it wasn't gymnastics focused so much. And I kept listening and tuning in and um, was intrigued by what he was saying, but also it would uh, make me angry sometimes because I wasn't sure I agreed with what he was always saying, which, you know, is normal. Um, But I do know it was at the same time that I started that I had begin began writing this program that I wanted to teach to children about uh, character development, but I wasn't I was just writing it. I had no plan of how to 
get it out into the world or what even I was doing with it. But I was writing it because I felt like it was a need. And he was talking about his thing. So this was about two years ago. And then one, I can remember one post he did where he said, if you're just following me and you're not taking any action, then you can, it was along this lines, I'm not quoting him. <laughs> then the way I heard it was, if you're following me and you're not taking any actions, then you can unfollow me. Well, that re I was like, what the heck? How, <laughs> you know, I'm taking actions in my book right here. I'm writing all this down. So how can you say I'm not taking action? But after a while, you know, you know, I wasn't, I was just putting it in my book. I was just sharing it only with myself. <laughs> so I wasn't going to be able to make any impact if I didn't step up and take an actual action out into the world. And so I kept following him and, uh, then he began this lifestyle design and I was like, well, maybe that would help me figure out which direction I'm heading and how to clearly state what I'm doing and to figure out what I'm doing. And so I uh, worked with him through lifestyle design. Um, and that's when the ball got rolling and then that's where everything's been happening from there. So it's, uh, I always feel fortunate that I decided to take that step to reach out to him. I really like the the analysis of like that one post and just what that post made you think because it got me thinking. I'm like, well, heck, I mean, something that I reflected on a lot, like we can get frustrated over a lot of things. But most of our frustration is derived from the fact that we didn't do anything. Like, mm -hmm. I can be frustrated over something I don't have. But I never identify the fact that I didn't do anything to have that thing. Um, a person could be frustrated that they don't, they haven't been on a podcast. But then maybe they they never tried having their own podcast. Like, I think that that's, there's so many common themes. I mean, Every starts somewhere. Um, every every trainer had a very first training session. Every mm -hmm. author had a very first uh, first draft, first book, first word, first sentence. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the that deep meaning and taking that very first step, just like you talk about in your journey to uh, deepen connections in your life and open up your your circle as it were um you had a post on just one of one of your uh, interactions where you traveled to go to lifestyle design and i i really liked how you told your story about traveling on planes and stuff because i find a lot of people it's basically um we don't know who we're helping until we've helped them and so the story of you flying on a plane, I think, is really empowering in the sense that not many people have the, the strength to share that story. So what was that experience like for you? And like, how did it how did it challenge you? How did it change you, etc.? Okay, um, yeah, so the lifestyle design I did with Carl was one on one mentoring, coaching type. And then yes, I would travel to the insider which is in a weekend seminar event that he holds. And yes, I don't enjoy travel, uh, airplane travel, especially it's very uh, overwhelming to me. The whole going through the conveyor belts. <laughs> oh yeah. That whole process <laughs> is that, just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I haven't traveled alone just a handful of times so going to the insider was a big step in itself and then traveling by myself to san francisco was another big step in itself and you're right you know one thing i want to do and that i hope that children and everybody can see is that social media does present we as I tell my children in the classes that I've taught that, you know, we want to share the perfect happy moments of our lives, 
because we want to celebrate those moments. So of course it's natural that that's the stuff that we want to put out there socially for everybody to see our accomplishments, our birthdays, our celebrations, all the good stuff. But we do have to remember that that doesn't mean that that's all that there is. And sharing the struggle or the fears or doubts socially is much more difficult, but I think it's very needed because it'll help children. I always say children, but I, I always think everybody, it helps us all see that connection if we can put some of it out there so that people can connect and say, yeah, I, and I see, I see that. I feel that I understand that instead of just all the wonderful stuff that's wonderful to share. Well, so, and even just the process of uh, putting that out there, probably very similar to when you're working on a writing project and you put things on paper and you get that out of your head or like just off your mind because you have, it's like uh, saying something out loud, saying that, okay, I am going to climb a mountain. And then you tell a few people and then it becomes like a reality. You'll climb a mountain. Mm -hmm. Just just like that, we can uh, talk about our, our frustrations or our weaknesses or our setbacks or the things that we're scared of. And then we put that out, even if we're journaling or if we're making it into mm -hmm. a social media post, then it's like, well that scary thing doesn't seem so scary anymore because I've introduced that thing to everybody I know. I've introduced it to the whole right. internet. <laughs> it's got nothing on right. me anymore. Yeah. And I yeah. think that process is just so, so empowering. Yes. If we can learn to share those, yeah, it make it takes a lot of power away from the fear and the doubt and the, and the worries. Because if you know you're, not alone in that and that person was able to make it to the take the next step then i should be able to too and to help children see that and you know right before the pandemic when i was in the classrooms when i finished a presentation immediately when i'm packing up to leave the classroom they want to come up to me and tell me about their worries. And that's what they, and you know, they just know me for that 45 minutes or whatnot, but they should be able, they should feel the freedom and the ability and the strength to be able to do that with who they choose to share those worries with and not keep them hidden because they feel like the process is perfect. You know, they need to know that it's always imperfect. That's, that got me thinking, like, <laughs> you left me speechless there for a second, because then I'm like, well, yeah, they, they should be able to, I think everybody should be able to, and um, we should be creating space for our, our fellow human to be able to kind of feel like it's an ebb and flow process, like, mm -hmm. so if they, if what we see is nothing but perfect, 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 perfect. And I talk about this all the time. I'm like, look, like, it doesn't matter who we're talking about. It doesn't matter if it's a pro athlete, a professor, a doctor, a nurse, anybody is having a tough day. Um, when it comes to, like, we talked about connection and the meaning of, uh, like, how meaningful it is to have that ability to connect with people on social media or in our backyard or through like a neighborhood float, anything like that, um, having that out there, but it's one thing to just connect and just be like, Hey, how's it going? Good. You good. You. And it's another thing to mm -hmm. connect and be like, Hey, I'm just going to lay it out here. I am scared of this, this, and this. I'm mad about this. When we talk about this, I get upset. There it is. And I think that's, that's what we need more of. And you talk about um, empowering kids. And I think it's important to give kids those tools in their toolbox. Like how would they have those tools in their toolbox otherwise? Right. So. Yeah. The, uh, false impression. Children falsely believe that perfect straight line. And so if they're wavering underneath that line or feeling 
poorly or frightened, then they that po that possibility disappears because it's the perfect possibility and they're not perfect. So if they can understand and see that it's an imperfect process and that when they're feeling sad, that that changes. It's not there forever. Emotions always change. So they need to know that these waves and these ups and downs are a part of it. So that possibility never disappears. It just sometimes looks like it's hidden, but just wait and just keep going. It'll shine again. So for myself, I, I totally resonate with what you say with uh, wait and keep going, um, like trusting the process. And like, I'll share with you some of my frustrations that I have. Like I am, for me, I'm a personal trainer and everything that I do is based on one-on-one -on -one connections and it's based on um, the, these lasting uh, reoccurring training sessions or they're based on like the internet connection working. Like I'm still training some people, but then like um, my internet has to be active. Like if, if the Wi-Fi goes out, I'm hooped. Uh, and then the podcast is, is kind of reliant on like you, as a podcast host, you kind of want to see like a trend, an upward trend. You want to see a uh, greater audience or you want to see um, being able to have conversations with, with guests and stuff. And then every single thing that you do, whether you're one-on-one -on -one training with clients, well, you're going to have some clients that have to have a operation in the hospital or they move to a new province or a new state or a new country. Um, maybe like it is a reality that people get so fit and independent that they go through into another phase of their life. Um, some clients right. become trainers one day. Like I know I used to do the fitness classes and then I started leading the fitness classes. So it's just like, there's things that are out of our control. And so from like a statistical standpoint, we'll see it go up and down and up and down. And just like same right. thing with our, our moods. And then as such, we have to have like this, uh, some kind of uh, faith in the process or, or trust in, in just that things will go well. Um, wh what is your process with that? Like I, I spoke a lot, but like your turn. How, how do you have trust in the process? How do you take one step forward after another? Um, that's a good question. I think it has to do with awareness, I think an awareness of the process itself, an awareness that everything changes and you can only, and an awareness of what you're in control of. So I have to come back into myself and see if there's something that's blocking me, that's getting in my way of where I want to go I have to be able to uh, look around basically and find a different way. So to know that the path is going to be not going to go my way always, that I have to adapt and, and look and be aware and look for different solutions and different ways to go. And it might even, and my, possibility might even change you know like originally I wanted to teach a workshop style class to children in a gym combining movement and mindset and now it's turned into a book that I want to take into schools and it'll probably change from there so being able to transform and adapt and be aware I think. Yeah. Are big. And you know, that comes and goes. You know, you get stuck. You always get stuck, but true. <laughs> if you it's keep true. looking. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I had a conversation with my parents yesterday and I was like, you know, I am I am aware that I have really good days and I have blah days. <laughs> like I have yeah, days when correct. I'm on fire and I have days when it's just like I am slow. I am not gonna get much done. 
but I can account for those and I can sort of meet myself where I'm at. Um, in the very good and days, with maybe not judging it either. J changing the way I think about judgment was huge. You know, having a slow day doesn't equal a bad day. Agreed. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally relate to that because, uh, I think a lot of people are finding themselves in that position where they'll be able to relate to that. And it's, there's a lot of, uh, articles that are being released, which are quite helpful in the sense that like, Hey, I mean, when it comes to fitness, um, it's going to be a little bit different. You're not going to be framing it with the fitness of the past. You're going to do the activity that you need in order to feel good in that day, not necessarily doing the activity that you needed to feel good in a day when your environment was different. Like, um, our, our social dynamics are different. The amount of energy that we exert on different things are different. Um, how much we learn or where we learn it from is different. Like people are learning more from each other than from, from one source because just mm -hmm. our, our communication is, is different where I, I find that, I'm learning more about people that I never expected to learn more about and it's changing my perspective and it's changing how I see things and it's helping me find perspective. Something that, that brings great meaning to the podcast for me is um, leaning into that perspective. I mean, you and I are different and yet there are similarities, but through hearing your stories and your experiences, I get this broader perspective in being able to target or tackle my things that I have to overcome. And it just compounds right. with time from, from guest to guest to guest. And then mm -hmm. from, from your standpoint, when, when I ask you different questions, you, you get to learn a little bit differently about yourself because you've had to think and get introspective. And it's like, sure. we're, we're out of our comfort zone in a sense. Like, uh, we, yes. we started this episode as two strangers for the most part. Like we followed each other on social media, but like this is right. the first time we've communicated. And I guess that's the value in, in connection. We, we bring two new people together and they tell things about themselves and they put it out there and it's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I, if I should talk about that because I'm not feeling that that is something that I've talked about every single day. Like when somebody asks a new question, it's like, that's a tough question. Um, yeah. That's clearly, it's a, it's always a tough question for a reason. It's a tough question because we haven't spoken about it 20 times a week. Or it's a tough question okay. because we never thought about it that way. But then mm -hmm. by, by putting out it out there, then we get to that, uh, we almost feel equipped to handle it. Or we have a new way of seeing it. Or our perspective is broadened. So right. yeah. Our your expectations have to change. I mean, you, you don't know what to expect, so you have to be open to more and able to expand beyond your expectations, maybe. Yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> um, expectations can hold us back quite a bit. You, you know, like yes. a lot of people are frustrated because they have these expectations for what life is. Like they're like, I can't, I can't go to the music festival because that's right. what summer is. But then it's like mm -hmm. there, there's different opportunities to do totally different things in the summer. I mean, um, as, as different um, regions and municipalities and countries and states and provinces reinstate different policies, it's mm -hmm. likely that different types of gatherings would be allowed or different types of events would be allowed. And it's like, so that is the summer this year. So it's like, it's not like summer yeah. is canceled. You're just reinventing no. your summer. It's interesting because uh, we are limited in certain ways, but I think it's forcing us to expand in different ways. So the limitations are, yeah, helping. I've taken away the expectations, like you said, of what summer is, but now what can summer be? Yeah. You know, we have to look at it and make it a new, new thing. I mean, yeah, expectations are gone for what you're going to. And we can, 
relay that to our own journeys as well like our expectation like you're you had the hopes of speaking to to large groups and from from my perspective i'm like oh well you'll still be able to speak to large groups you get to reinvent yourself now you get to go through that process and find find the new ways find the things that uh suit you that feel right that where you get to be yourself but be yourself in the biggest loudest way um like from from my perspective it's like this is a great time for for me because i've just gone through so much um reinventing of myself like i wasn't always a trainer so i had to reinvent myself to go into that and Mm -hmm. i i wasn't uh always doing a podcast so i kind of had to reinvent myself to go into that and like of course like the first one that was tough and like for the first 20 episodes um i was a little rusty and then you just you get that practice and then i lots of room for improvement still but it's i have that process and i think okay like I'm I'm trusting in my purpose in doing this and I'm just right. going to keep putting in that work no matter whether it gets 10 lessons, 500 lessons, 1,000 lessons. Yeah. It is meaningful to me and so I will put in the work and I see that in, in your author journey, putting in that work and trusting that process. But I want to hold you accountable to your goals. So what's a big goal that you have? Because then if we put it out there into the world, wouldn't it be cool to see that happen and reflect on it years later? Yeah. Um, I would say my, like, if, I don't know how big you want to go, but my, <laughs> my, what I would love to see is character development, um, learning about the process of growth, of a growth mindset to become in schools and for children more of a focus and move away from uh, test scores so much and change what we're focusing on. Because when I think of my own children, when they leave from here, I, as a parent, I would feel most comfortable or at ease if I know that my children have the ability to, to keep going, to uh, adapt, to problem solve, as opposed to uh, having a, being on the honor roll. You know, we have to change what we're celebrating, maybe, what we're focusing on. Uh, When I was teaching, you see what the children are interested in during free time. And they'll build things or paint things or read or whatever it is that is they're drawn to. And then when the free time's over, we have them clean it up and put it away. But we didn't celebrate what they spent that 25 minutes building that you know they don't want to knock down that block structure they built because they just created that and so i and so we would take pictures of our creations because we couldn't save them all there's not enough room in the classroom but if you worked hard on that and that has some meaning to you and it's amazing this was back in the day where I had to develop the film, but we take a picture of it, develop it, and put the picture up on the wall. So maybe you didn't do so well in math that day, but man, that block structure you built was amazing. And you took so much time with it and you put so much effort into it. That's what we need to be focusing on as opposed to you have to reach X, Y, and Z benchmark. Because if you can leave this classroom with a feeling of I put this effort in to make this and it happened, then you can go out and do that wherever you want to do it in the world. But if we just focus on the benchmarks they can't meet and we label them with not quite good enough, they lose, they they don't see the process. They can't see the growth they can't feel the growth so somehow i want to put that back in 
to make it more visible for children. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think that's important. And especially during this time, um, we got people that feel they feel like they lost something because of how the dynamics of a graduation changed or because of because so much relies on marks and like in in university and college settings too like a lot of things have changed there and so much of of just purpose is tied or correlated to this number on a piece of paper and mm -hmm. as important as that is there is so much more i mean people people are making memories and connecting with with relatives that they would have never otherwise connected with just because the the social dynamics have changed and people are learning that grit like there's a lot of people who are going to come out of a situation like this changed forever in a good way because yeah all of their expectations were thrown out the window and yeah. they were surrounded by people who had the the capabilities to show them their inner strength like whether it be um a family that is uh self-isolating together and then it's like somebody had a bad day well they got to lean on on a parent or a sibling or maybe it's like mm -hmm. someone that lives on their own but then they learned how to reach out to a friend and be like hey having a bad day i need to pick me up or um maybe people learned the value like if anything else um, I've definitely learned the value of when you go to the grocery store for, for your necessities, the value of a smile. Like you start to really feel how yes. impactful a it's smile a is. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yes, I feel that. And that feels uh, hopeful to me um, because, yeah, you know, the the grades for now are gone, <laughs> but there's huge lessons that we can help each other learn from this uh if we pay attention yeah and then if we look at the it, at life just as a whole I've, I've never had a conversation with anybody who like 10 years after post-secondary or 10 years after grade 7 or grade 12 they were like oh man if anything mattered it was certainly the grades that i got on my final <laughs> like they're talking about yeah. someone that they met or they're talking about mm -hmm. um, an experience that they had that made them choose a certain career or they're talking about like a time when yeah. they had a near-death experience and it gave them this great sense of purpose for something very specific and it's never been about grades as much as that can mm -hmm. help it's like a stepping stone that's just like a tiny tiny step in the grand scheme of things so yeah, yeah I hope that people find their ways to um find find their purpose and find the value in the things that we do have control of yes yeah definitely so in the last seven days what is one thing that has brought you the most joy in the last seven days um i have to say just being together um, you know, nobody's rushing off from just my household here. Nobody is, has to rush off and get anywhere. So we have time to just be and to do the slower down things together. Um, I think that's, those are the moments that I am really enjoying. I think, yeah, like that, that's so cool to reflect on because then we have to wonder like how many times did we take those things for granted or how many times did we not like mandate that as like a, as a core value or as like a non-negotiable as like, okay, like this has to happen. Like these other things, they can wait because this yeah. thing that brings me joy is actually probably one of the more important things in life. And so yeah. I like that's that people... Yeah. I've also been kind of amazed, you know, that's in the household here, but I also have uh, my parents who are in their 80s and watching them, you know, I can't go in their house or, but I, you know, they live in town with us. So we have visited in the backyard from a safe distance a few times, but watching them um, order online groceries, figuring out that system, uh, watching them 
figure out ways that to keep themselves busy. Um, my dad did his first, you know, doctor's appointment over the phone, you know, watching them, you know, at, in their 80s adapting is also, I feel proud about it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's how we're going to do it, you know. Absolutely. So. Like, it's super cool to see how fast uh, everybody is learning to uh, reinvent themselves in the sense of, oh, we're going to communicate with, with a video call or, oh, we are going to yeah, use like e-commerce. Yeah. 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 Before this, you were like, no, I don't have to do that. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> and then, well, now you can do it. Look at that. So, yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah. true. So if you were going to give one piece of advice on how to live your life to the fullest in the most authentic way, what would that piece of advice be? I would say in the most authentic way to live it without labels, uh, without labels on yourself and without labels on others, others, um, which is a whole, which is difficult because the words pop into your mind especially um the other day my husband said are you tired because I had my head down on the table and I was like just tired of the <laughs> own words that are running through my head the narrative the labels of what I can and can't do and that I have to address them as they come up so if you can I think maybe you always hear the labels in some way in your narrative or in your own story but if you can take them away and go beyond them that's huge because the labels stop you labels tell you what you can and can't do and labels for others you know labels are judgments i think labels and judgments go hand in hand so I think if you're aware of those two things and you're always working on going past them, that'll help. That'll help you get where you wish to go. You put it really well. And I think that's important for everybody. And I think it's just like how we talked about uh, different people at different stages in our life. We, I think we can't help it. We're often going to find ourselves putting labels on ourselves no matter how practiced we are, but that awareness mm -hmm. piece of putting that on the table, like, Hey, let's, let's work on not doing that. Stepping back from that and empowering yeah. ourselves a, a bit more can be a, a really good sentiment. But uh, yes, I, I always say I'm not a dog person. I don't know. I always say that or feel that or think that, but I have a dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> so funny. Yeah, <laughs> And I'm not a dog person. I have a dog and I love my dog. So I don't know. That's not, you know, I don't know. That just always pops into my head. Like that is so untrue, but I always say that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can relate. I say often that I'm more of a dog person than a cat person, but I've spent a lot of quality time with a lot of different cats in the world. So it's exactly we get our own inner monologue and it, it shapes things. Um, but essentially, that basically wraps it up for today. So I'd like to thank you for joining me on, on the show. Well, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Your challenge for today's episode is to unleash your creative side. Think of some way that you're going to be creative, whether you do a dance, whether you write something, paint something, draw something, build something, and post about it in the page at The Lifestyle Chase on Instagram, and hold yourself accountable. Thank you for listening. Be sure to check out past episodes of The Lifestyle Chase at thelifestylechase.podbean.com and we will catch you next time. See ya.